This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love every Saturday. And we are reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, this is what I'm going to share with that old creature and all things becoming new. The Lord dropped this in my mind, and it, it, to me is such a great example. A lot of times we tolerate the old me. You tolerate the old you. We tolerate the old we. So, moving right along, let's paint a scenario, and let's go with one of my analogies. Sometimes, and this came from God, that's where I get my analogies from. Sometimes we get a chance to go somewhere really, really special. It may be an evening affair with evening attire. And we want to dress <laughs> to impress. Hello. We want to be cute, fine. We want to be together. We want to be tight. We want to have it going on. So, we go to the store or we go to the closet to find something we've never worn before. Either way, we're looking for something new. So we look for a new outfit. We look for new shoes. We want to do a different hairdo that people don't normally see us in. We want to get a fresh haircut for some of you brothers that want to look tight for the occasion. You might be looking for that right tuxedo, whether it's a purchase or a rental. You want it to be something nobody has seen you in before. So everything must appear or be new. Correct. All right. Well, one thing we don't want to do is carry an old bag, wear an old coat, wear some old raggedy shoes to an evening attire occasion. We don't want br to bring something old into something that we want everything to be fresh and new. Well, for some reason, many of us as born-again Christians allow our old things, our old ways, the old workings of our flesh to come with us as we go into the world representing Christ as ambassadors of Christ. And instead of wearing our best, instead of being our best, we make allowances for some of our worst ways. For some of those old ways, as we refer to the old man, we allow the old man to have a seat next to us in our new life. And there are times we make allowances for the old man. As Romans chapter 7 says, and I'm going to it right now, wasn't sure what I was going to read except those two, so this is not on the agenda, but I was led to read it for this message. So a lot of times we don't realize the amount of allowances we make. And we have the ability to dress for the occasion, but it's easier sometimes to slap something on that's old because we don't want to go through all that it takes to really, really, really look fresh and new. And sometimes we want the old to express itself because for some of you, there's nothing more satisf satisfying than cussing somebody out. That's some of that old stuff. There's nothing more satisfying than putting somebody in their place. That's some of that old stuff. There's nothing more gratifying and self-exalting self than looking down on someone else because they don't measure up to our expectations or what we think they ought to be doing. God's question to you, who made you the standard? 
So we have to be careful about making allowances for the old man. All right. Now, let's go down. This is Romans chapter 7. Here we go. Verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Lord that it is good. Now, when it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. When Pat and I were talking last night, Pat quoted that scripture, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's the way it is with us a lot of times. We want to do right. We want to do our best. We want to put our best foot forward. We want to represent when it comes to the things of Christ. But sometimes that old man, that old man has his way. And when that old man has his way, we make a mess of things when we make allowances for that old man. There are a lot of different little tricks that comes from the flesh that are very, very subtle. I was sharing with someone earlier that there are times when we think we're doing God's work. We're doing God's will. We're serving God. But well, whatever you do, here's another one of those little tricks. Don't serve God at the expense of your soul. You wonder, well, how can that be at the expense of your soul? Here's how. You can get so busy serving God that you don't have time to assemble yourselves with other believers. You don't have time for the corporate anointing that comes with meeting with the body of Christ. See, God did not design us in the body of Christ to fly solo. So when we get busy for the Lord, we have to remember we are connected to the vine. You hear me? If we disconnect from the vine, we die. So no matter what you're doing for the Lord, if everything you do about your life is flying solo, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you're looking for a perfect group or a perfect body of Christ, you are not going to find it. Because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we are always going to fall short. Thank God for Jesus. That's the difference. That's what makes the equation come out perfectly every time. It's Jesus, not us. Not our holiness, not the way we serve God, not to what extent we serve God. But you can wear yourself out serving God at the expense of your soul. And before you know it, you will grow to hate the body of Christ. You will grow to resent the people of God. You will grow to not to be bored with the gathering of the saints to hear the word of God. Why? Because Satan knows how to play little Holy Ghost self-righteous tricks on us. Not the real Holy Ghost. He's the imitator. And he can make you think that you're better than anybody else because you're on it and they're not. What I found when I used to go to church years ago, I used to, I was telling this person, I went to prison ministry at 7 a.m. Y'all know I'm a night person, not a morning person. But prison ministry was my baby. It drove me. God called me to that as my outreach ministry. I didn't do what everybody else did. My call was prison ministry, and that's what I did. So I would go to prison ministry twice a month, every month. And I would drive out to Camarillo Ventura Youth Correctional Facility. That was an hour and 15 minute drive each way. I would get there at 7 a.m. 
We'd have two services. I preach one message for the young men. I preach another message for the young women. And then we do counseling all afternoon after eating with them at lunch. We would counsel with them in the chaplain's office in the afternoon. Around four o'clock, I'd be on the freeway heading back. But if they didn't have counseling, like if I went to Linwood, or, you know, before then I used to go to Civil Brand, Twin Towers, Linwood. It all transitioned because that's where they moved that particular ministry. Every time they relocate the women, we would go where they relocated them to. So I would be there at 7 a.m. in L.A., signing in, getting cleared. And then we, we'd have our little orientation and we'd get our assignments and we'd go to the different areas we were sent to. And we minister a church service for that particular pod, as they call it. So when we would get through, I would hit the freeway and go straight to church. And my pastors knew that I would always be about a half an hour late because I was coming straight from prison ministry. So what I found as I was doing that, was there were people in the church I thought weren't doing anything. They just come to church, get happy, go home. And I'd look at them like, hmm, and the Lord straightened me out because he started letting me know through conversations down through the months and years that so-and-so had been busy feeding the poor while I was busy doing prison ministry that so-and-so over there was visiting all the sick and shut-in all through the week while I was doing prison ministry. So I found that different people had their callings and elections. They were doing whatever it was they were supposed to do for the Lord. And what I realized was everybody wasn't to do everything. But what I also knew, and I learned this in church, you don't do the outside ministry in expense of being gathered with your people, with God's people. You have to make sure because it's like the baby sucklings. And I'm sharing this with you because these are the, some of the little tricks that Satan uses. You're doing what you're doing for the Lord, but Satan will do it to your detriment. You wear yourself out. And you think, I'm pleasing God, I'm pleasing God. But you're not getting fed. You're not going in to the church or gathering with the saints, however they gather, to get the word of God in your system. And you find yourself serving God so much, you don't have time to get fed. That's not the way God designed it. He made us all connected to the vine. So... Yes, you minister, but just like the mother bird does to the baby chick, the mother goes out and gets the worm and she feeds herself. And then she gets the extra worms and she brings them to the nest. And then she has something to feed the babies with. So you have to have the strength to fly out, come back, get fed, fly back out, feed others, come back, get fed. You have to make sure that you're constantly being fed in order to have to give. And the beautiful part is as you give, God waters you. As you water others, others God will water you. So here's some of the tricks I want to go into with what Satan does to trick us even while we're trying to do good, not only with sin, but with good. We're going to combine the two. We're going to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to verse 6 through verse 10. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Which means we give him permission 
to devour. He can't devour you unless you allow it. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I'll read 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, one of the things that Satan does to trick us as he's seeking whom he may devour. Let me share this with you. I knew a person who pastored a church. And this person was busy, 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 busy. A busy little bee. And what God did was he... Uh, she had scheduled a guest speaker to come in. The speaker had a prophetic word for the minister, for the pastor. And he shared with the pastor that he had sent the pastor five to, it was, I think, six to 12 different ministers called to preach the gospel. Some called to counsel, some called to to help, you know, do administrative work, all different types of gifts. And what the speaker said to the pastor was, God has gifted you with an abundance of gifts under your pastorate, but you're not using the gifts that I sent because you think you have to do it all. Some of you have a hard time delegating because you want all the credit. You don't want anybody to outshine you. That too is threatening. Think about that one and then pray about it. And what God is warning you about is do not wear yourself out trying to do everything. God said you help. Receive the help. Receive it. Use what God has sent you. And what ended up happening was this particular person was waiting for a relative to relocate so that they could turn their whole pastorate over to their relative. The relative never relocated. The pastor ended up with Alzheimer's, uh, I mean, just burnt. And, and the church ended up having to fold because there was no one there left to carry it on because everybody that would have helped had gone elsewhere where they could be used. So what I'm trying to say to you is be careful not to allow Satan to use your good intentions to, to burn you out and to have you depleted where you should be built up on the inner man. You can be easily depleted. Now, Let's move on to those of you who are allowing Satan to trick you with the old man, with your old ways. Some of you, you have made so many allowances, and some of your allowances are, we're going to go down the list, and we're not going to talk about smoking, drinking, and fornication as much as we're going to deal with the subtle sins. Laziness. Some of you won't pick up a Bible unless somebody slaps you in the face with it. Or if it's in your way and you need to move it. So you can do what you want to do. Number two. Some of you are very judgmental and intolerant of other people when you don't know their story. And there is a scripture. God led me to that this morning. Judge nothing before it's time. See, when God gets through with it, he's going to uncover everything. And then the judge is going to make his statement. And all of us will know what's what, who's who. So judge nothing before it's time. And be careful not to judge others. Be careful about that. It's subtle. We may think it's a righteous indignation. And God may see it as being judgmental. Another thing we have to be careful of, resentment. Some of us build up resentment.
because we don't address issues and we make assumptions. And while we're assuming the devil is whispering all kind of lies in our ear. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I saw him. I know that's where they're coming from. Yeah, you're right. You're right on target. And God is like, you're listening to the wrong voice, baby. And your reaction, unfortunately, is heading in the wrong direction. So what ends up happening when you resent and you make assumptions and you listen to the lies the devil is adding as he adds fuel to your fire is you end up parting yourself from the people of God. And you've got to be careful about that because that's what Satan wants. Isolate the saint and attack. Be careful. All right. Another, another possible uh, sin that we do and we don't always realize we're doing it is having big eyes and little use. It's another form of judgment and pride. Some people we see as, yeah, they're on it. And some people we see as, well, I don't know about them. We have to be careful about that too. Because the one we're welling about might be the one God's hand is heaviest on. But we don't see it. So we draw conclusions. Be careful. Don't judge anything before it's time. All right. And what we end up doing is staying away from certain people that God may want us to draw close to and drawing close to people that God may not want us to be bothered with. Let me share this. Two months ago, I met someone and the Lord let me know through the conversation that I could not, I was going to befriend the person. We were going to hang out. It was going to be cool. They were born again Christians, but the Lord let me know, messy, 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 avoid, avoid, avoid at all costs. And I said, wow. So I started listening to the conversation and I heard exactly what God was trying to warn me of. And I said, all right, first thing, barely on, barely in where they were. And they were blaming people that they had just met of being caught up in stuff that there's no way they could have known anything about. And when I let them know that the person was about the Lord, they were, oh, oh, well, that's good. And their whole tone changed. And I said, there's the messy. One minute, they're a demon. The next minute, oh, that's good. And then one minute they were going to do this and the next minute they're not going to do it and they were going to stay and the next minute they're moving. And I said, okay, one of those. Some people are so shifty. You have to be very careful. They're not the ones you want for your friend because they shift too much. They're on shaky ground, baby. And from one minute to the next, you really don't know where they're coming from. Be careful. Smiling faces sometimes pretend to be your friend. Smiling faces show no traces of the evil that lurks within. Smiling faces, smiling faces sometimes they don't tell the truth. Smiling faces, smiling faces tell lies, and I got proof. Beware. Some of those people are some of you on YouTube. You're great one minute, you're off the next, you love one minute, you can't be bothered the next, you're with this one minute, you're gone the next. Any little bump in the road and your whole attitude changes. That's not being called stable. That's called being driven about with every wind of doctrine. And we don't realize how easily we shift, 
how easily our mind changes, how easily our attitude changes because we are bothered by something. So this particular one that I'm talking about, now they're getting ready to totally relocate when they just relocated here. You know, one thing the Lord showed me, and that's one thing a lot of us have problems with, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And some born-again Christians are double-minded and don't know it. Now, let's move on to some other things. Some of you are gluttonous. You don't even chew the food. You don't smell the food. You don't savor the food. You inhale it. And you live to eat. Everything you do, the highlight of the day is what we're going to eat. Eat, eat, eat. Gobble, gobble, gobble. You just want to gobble it down, baby. Sometimes we don't realize we have either a gluttonous spirit or we are compulsive eaters. You get upset, you want to eat. You get scared, you want to eat. You get disgusted and angry, you want to eat. You get offended, you want to eat. That's another thing. We don't realize it. <laughs> These are those little subtle things that aren't listed in the works of the flesh. Yeah, but they're subtle. They're in there, but they're not the prominent ones, the dominant ones. Another one that we tend to be, and this is a very, this is a, a, a killer right here. Unforgiveness. Some of you are so bitter, so unforgiving. You don't forget. Just like I did on that video that's titled, uh, they keep telling me I'm bitter. And I did a skit. And what did the woman keep saying? I don't forget. It's like no matter what, she's not going to forget what anybody did. And she has a right to her bitterness. That's the way many bitter, resentful, angry, unforgiving people feel. They have a right to their bitterness. But I want to share this with you. If you know how to spell Jesus forward, backwards, upside down, inside out. Filled with the Holy Ghost out with a mighty burning fire. When the last day for your life comes. And you think you're getting ready to fly. You may be sitting there wondering why you're descending. And the word will come to you. If you do not forgive them. I will not forgive you. Bottom line, for many of you who think you can be saved and you have a right not to forgive, God says, you don't forgive them, I don't forgive you. Now, here's another thing for you to think about when it comes to forgiveness. Forget the lack of forgiveness, that bitterness will eat at you. It'll make you hard. What does Hebrews say? Harden not your heart as they did in the, in the wilderness in the day of provocation. Don't harden your heart. Because see, when you harden your heart, your love will grow thin. Your tolerance and patience will wane away. And you wonder why you don't want to be bothered. Why everybody's so jacked up. And you don't realize what you're really seeing everybody through is through the poisoned, the poisoned and warped vision of anger and unforgiveness. And because of that, you tend to grow cold. As the Bible says, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. And you don't realize you're getting cold. You don't realize you're hardening your own heart. You don't realize that. It's not going to hurt everybody else as much as it's going to hurt you at the end. Be careful with that. If you do not have the ability to forgive, 
Here's the remedy for that. Lord, this is what you say. Lord, would you please give me the ability to do what I don't want to do and do what I can't do. And if you give me the ability, I will. It's all you need to do is ask God for help. He's there to give you whatever it is you don't have. You're not able to love like you want to be able to love. Ask God to put it in there. You're not able to relax and trust him like you want to trust him. You're full of anxiety and worry and you blow off at the handle as soon as something goes out of line. Ask God to settle your nerves and speak to you through his word and calm you down. See, we think we have to handle everything by ourselves. So we don't go to God for every little nook and cranny. We want to handle it because we're grown. I ain't no baby. Hey, if you want to be in the body of Christ like God wants you to be in there, you better be a baby. You better hurry up and demote yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. Don't exalt yourself because you're going to trip over yourself. Trust me. Your feet will be too big for you. And they will trip you up every time. I hope you heard that in the spirit. He that has an ear, let him hear. Woo! Okay. Now. Another one of those little subtle, subtle sins is coming to me right now. Some of you, you want everybody else to do everything for you. You don't want to take the effort to do what it takes to get from point A to point B. So, you lean on your sickness. You lean on your infirmity. You lean on your weaknesses. And you ride that wave out like a surfer. You surf your sicknesses. And the reason you do that is because the weaker, the sicker, the more tired, the more afflicted you are, the less people will expect you to do. The less people will expect you to do, the, le the less responsibility. And you can be at ease in Zion. And God says, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. See, God didn't place us on this planet to eat, sleep, drink, and be merry. He placed each and every one of us here with a purpose. We must be about doing something for the Lord and taking care of business in the responsibilities God has put in our private lives. We can't wait for somebody else to solve our problem every time we have an issue. We can't wait for somebody else to come and cook our meals and buy our food and take us to the store and call the bill collectors. And, 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 and <laughs> there are some things God wants you to do yourself. I can't expect Pat to drive out here from her city to come into my kitchen and wash my dishes because I'm so tired and I'm so sick and weak and I'm so old. I'm sorry. The more we do, the less tired we feel because it's the motion that gets you in the ocean. Things start moving. You get motivated. The more you do, the more you put your hands to do. Don't burn out, but find that happy medium. God will guide you, but some of you don't want to do a thing. If somebody tells you to get online, click this button, click that button, you don't want to be bothered. Too complicated. You won't even take the time to learn. Why? Ask yourself, why? Now, this is not a message of condemnation because every single one of us falls short. I can list my lazy ways, but I ain't going to tell you my business. So each and every one of us has those lazy areas where we just 
pet them and set them aside. Yeah, I'll deal with that later. Yeah, we all got them. So I'm not picking at you because while I'm listing yours, I'm looking at mine. I'm like, okay, I, I won't mention that one. But I'm just talking about the little subtle things. Some things are sins and some are just besetting behavior that holds us back. I'm thinking of taking a, a an eschatology course. I'm thinking about it. I'm waiting for God to give me the sign, the, the go ahead, because I ain't going into it. If I don't have, you know, I don't have what it takes to do it, I'm not going to do it. But if God gives me the green light, I will by faith. But let me tell you this. That means I'm going to be hitting the books. I'm going to be studying. I won't be yakking on the phone. I'll be reading. And guess who doesn't like to read? But only if God says do it. Sometimes the other thing we do on the other extreme, we take on more than God told us to do. Mm -hmm. And God will say, I didn't tell you to do that. I know someone who lost two or three major things in their lives because they kept doing what God did not tell them to do. And they were productive things, but it wasn't the time for them. And as a result, they got broker and broker, poorer and poorer, and now they can't even live on their own. That wasn't God's fault. It's not because God's not providing. It's because they stepped out of God's will. And anytime any of you step out of God's will, you're out from under the ark of safety. The covenant is not guaranteed. Because now there are consequences for presumptuous acts. And that's why the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. But if you don't acknowledge, and you're acting on presumption, things can get real tight, real quick. And you're crying out for protection. You're crying out for rescue. And God is saying, but I didn't tell you to do that. So this lesson you'll have to learn the hard way. Some of us have learned some hard lessons because of presumption. I learned a hard lesson losing a car years ago because I presumed on God's protection when all the day God was warning me in my spirit, but I didn't get the memo. I didn't read the memo. So I'm thinking, oh, well, God's warning me, so I pray against it and I'll be all right. No, God was warning me so I would park my behind in my living room and leave my car in the, in the, in the driveway. As a result, I was left with no car for three years. That wasn't God's punishment. That was a consequence of a presumptuous sin. I didn't go out and get high, but God was warning me, and I went against what he was warning me about, presuming upon his protection. God is not a bellhop. You don't snap your finger with a prayer and God's got to come through for you. God is sovereign. He's not your trained puppy. He's not your bellhop and he's not your butler. And he's showing Santa Claus. And some of us treat him that way. Most of us have fault. How can I say this? Most of us have erred in that direction. Yours truly included. So what I'm saying is those are the subtle things. This is not a, a condemning. This is just a wake-up call. Be more aware of what you're saying, what you're thinking, why you're thinking it, why you're doing that, why you're not doing the other. Be very careful about that because those are the little, the little foxes, they say, is what spoils the mind. 
It's the little foxes. Not the big ones, the little ones. And it's those little foxes that we ignore. I've been like this all my life. I know God knows me. I'm in process. Don't take too long with that process, y'all. Because you do not want to pay the piper because you petted it one day too long. One time too many. Amen. Let's do all we can do to be all we can be in Christ Jesus. Let's seek him. Let's cry out to him. Let's hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. Hunger for holiness, y'all. That's the best appetite you could have. In the name of Jesus, God bless you.